So today's final and third debate topic is one we hope will engage the audience and address some of the questions that have been arisen over the past three days. Whose design? Sharing counter perspectives on dominant design gazes is moderated by Dr. Andrea Botero. Andrea is a Colombian born, Finland based designer and researcher. Her work engages with the possibilities and the contradictions of participating in the creation of environments, tools and media that afford more relation and caring interactions among and between people and their environment in particular. She studies how the design of the communication and information technologies shape the social outcomes, practices and horizons of possibilities for communities and collectives. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oahu in Finland and cons conspirer at the practice-based research studio, SU and Co. Welcome on stage. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I would like first to uh, thank the local organizers and Murian for reaching out and proposing this debate. Uh, I want to think of this as a manifestation of their interest on addressing some of the pressing issues in the state of diversity, inclusion, and plurality uh, of design research. Uh, issues which have been lingering for some time and have manifested themselves, amongst other things, uh, with a rejection two years ago by this conference of a controversial paper on the coloniality in design. While we won't solve the issues here, I see some hope in the fact that we are having this conversation. Uh, our topic today is whose design and together with you, uh, we want to explore diverse understandings and counterpoints to dominant design cases. I could have not hoped uh, for a better interlocutor uh, for this task, task than Sadi uh, and Arturo. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, can I have the next uh, slide, please? So, ah, oh, sorry, yes, I have, I'm sorry, I have the power myself. <laughs> Uh, so I will start to tell you uh, a bit about my own experiences through their work. Uh, this is by, not, uh, by any means uh, an exhaustive introduction to everything that these two people have produced, uh, but it is my, merely, my humble attempt to trace how my path has uh, worked uh, at certain points through theirs. I first read Arturo uh, uh, when I was a young design graduate stu student experimenting cultural shock in Europe. I had just attended a conference where a group of designers discussed the possibilities to set up a sort of Designers Without Borders initiative. I left that meeting totally confused. Those conversations mainly went on trying to map out places where they, as designers, would go and do some good. And the places discussed sometimes were referred as the third world. Arturo's encountering development, the making and unmaking of the third world book, by then a few years old, uh, provided me some ammunition to articulate my discomfort against that initiative. In the bigger picture, I tell you a secret. The third world is no longer a thing. Stop using the term. We met some years later in Helsinki, when he was already engaging writing territories of difference. This is his effort to think with Afro-Colombian intellectual and activists what it is that their struggles to defend their place-based culture and territories mean in terms of world-making. We had a wonderful conversation on the ontological dimension of design that has helped me to articulate better the type of designer I want to become. I learned about Sadi's work uh, first time online in 2016 through her MA thesis. I was and continue to be very inspired by her careful reading of Lakota visual grammar and the incredible and alive resource it is. That works represents very well her interest to develop resources for her people so that Lakota themselves can continue recreating their culture in their own design terms. A great contribution to the scarce resources available to discuss basics of form giving, not as a given, but as a part of a whole ways of thinking and being. In my mind, some of the ideas that Sadi discusses can be entry points to explain design as an ontological project, particularly for people that have a visual interest. See, for example, her Lakota visual, her Lakota Dakota visual essay. Uh, it is a reference that challenged some dominant views on design from a culture neither my Colombian nor my Finnish students 
know much about. It opens a way for them to see how their work is implied not only in terms of aesthetics, which it is, but also as world making in other very fundamental dimensions. Uh, this is the theme that also Arturo has been dealing with. It is perhaps not only a coincidence that Sari's MA thesis came out the same year of the publication of Arturo's latest book in Spanish, Diseño and Autonomia, where he addresses in more explicit ways design discourse by linking it to things he has learned, worked, and thinking with many Latin American social movements and struggles. In there, he proposes autonomia as an issue also of design, a transition design discourse with unique Latin American tones. English speakers would be happy to learn that the English version is also available since a few months ago. Having said that, and I'm sorry to disappoint some of you, that are expecting perhaps a debate amongst opposite positions. As you will see, both works do come from different angles and arrive at different places. However, for moments, they almost dance together, at least in my mind. I think so we're gonna continue on from here. Uh, Sadi, thank you, I'll give you this. We can have studies. Um, so I guess I'll get us, uh, while it gets pulled up, um, I wanna speak on the behalf of the three of us here and just give our thank you for, for allowing us to be up here on the stage and for allowing us to have the chance to speak. We know that this is a, a, a time where we don't get this very often, so we're very appreciative to have that. And, but first, before we even get started, I wanna take a minute to acknowledge the indigenous land of the Irish people, the Minty and our Heron, um, and acknowledge that this university is hosted on their lands and to give thanks that you know, we're able to have this opportunity to be here in the present. And I hope that everybody in the audience, when you go visit the homelands of us, us three up here, that you acknowledge that you're in the presence of their indigenous lands as well. So I'd be really thankful um, to hear that. If you ever come to the Midwest in America, please acknowledge that you might be in Lakota territory and, it might, and I would absolutely appreciate that. So, we have questions to answer, so I don't have a lot of time <laughs> um, to really share, but I need to at least give you guys an understanding of the perspective that I'm coming from. So, my name is Sadie Redwing. I am a citizen of the, the uh, Dakota, the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation, which is the little tiny dot of the north in North Dakota. Um, but you might hear that I more identify with Lakota. I grew up in uh, central South Dakota, um, raised by my grandmother in the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation, which is in the central South Dakota. Um, and I show this picture to give the audience an idea of what my people look like today. If anybody's been following the media and seen um, the, the controversial issues of the Dakota Access Pipeline coming through Central America, or sorry, Central of the United States, and that the pipeline is coming right through our, our territories. So um, there's the best way I can share what my home looks like, if you're familiar with the Standing Rock Movement. The Cheyenne River Reservation is, is right underneath the Standing Rock Movement. But the reason why I show this picture of what we look like today is because America has romanticized and created this fantasy image of what my culture, my people looks like. And I know a lot of you see it, and I know that a lot of this imagery is still present, and this is and I'm gonna admit, in some of these words that I'm saying, I'm not targeting anybody, but I, what I want to do in the few slides that I'm showing is to acknowledge the dominance in a lot of these resources. So for an image like this, I know this is seen in the continent of Europe. And this brings a little bit of fear in for me if when I wanted to visit places, for example, I see the fashion, I see the women in the undergarments with the headdresses or the feathered regalia, whether it's carnival or, or anything Great Plains related. Um, I see the parades in some of the countries where they're still imitating cowboys versus Indians. I see um, you know, products with these, these images and I'm, and I'm showing, I'm starting my frustrations in my journey in a screenshot. And I'm showing the Google results of when you Google Native American graphic design. Now, of course, Google varies on research depending on your data, but I want to really show that 98% of these images shown in this search results 
are works of non-Indigenous people. Now, let me say that again. In a research source like Google, the search results share less than 3% of actual Native American graphic design work. You don't see my work up there. You don't see Greg Deal's work up there. You don't see Ryan Redcorn's red, uh, work up there. What you see is the stereotypical images of this falsely, this fictional image that is supposed to represent my people. And that's very, so in terms of, a, of who is dominant in these research results, where that's, that's a problem. The lack of representation in something like Google, and I will omit that you click on some of these images and you'll see that a lot of them go back to Pinterest, or a lot of them go back to, and I'm sorry if there's any fans of Behance in here, but a lot of these images come from Behance. And if you Google Native American in Behance and you search, I guarantee, give yourself a challenge, go through 20 of those search results, and a lot of them come from uh, uh, more European countries. So I want to announce and acknowledge this, the dominance of what is being shown in, the, what are, in some of these resources that we have. And I pulled this from my thesis because I want to uh, quickly share the, the why. Why is there a sensitivity of, of stereotypes for the indigenous people when we're constantly told to get over it or it's in the past, but how can we? And I want to, I have movements listed on here, but all these movements are still today. We, we have boarding schools to this day. We are, we, the Hollywood stereotypes is still to this day. The American Indian movement is still to this day. But within this chart, I'm showing that. I know, I'll admit, when I share this, I speak to a lot of American audience, and I know they're not really fluent in American history. And that's, of course, American history is written wrong. But I want to acknowledge in this hundred of years time, my people were in boarding schools, which is a genocidal tactic to assimilate <coughs> to the colonized culture, meaning we were not exposed to our culture as literally beating out of us. So for a hundred years of not seeing, <coughs> seeing what, our, what we are as people until we get to the 40s, 50s, and 60s when we get presidents and laws and rights and technologies, and then we get the big movie screen and finally, finally, within 100 years' time, we get to see an image in Hollywood, the Western. Now, it's a blessing and a curse, a blessing in a way that it sparked the fire of us to identify with a figure, but it was a curse when that figure had to be stereotypical. And we're still trying to get out of that stereotypical phase. But I want to acknowledge why this wound of a stereotype is so harsh for us is because now my generations and the seventh generation we're trying to fight for sovereignty acknowledgement that we're not out of we're not pan indian together but it's small and we might need another hundred years to heal that wound but it's really hard to heal that wound when we're the only race in america that are confined to reservations we're the only race in America that are suggested to go to boarding schools. We're the only race in America calling ourselves American Indian when we're not from India. You know, we're the only race that are still trying to get human rights in terms of just clean water. Again, going back to the fight at Standing Rock and how hard it is for, for us to feel inclus inclusive in a space and safe in a space when we're still struggling with this historical trauma. So this is why is still sensitive to us. The conversations of cultural appropriation are exhausting. The conversations of sensitivities to, uh, to sports mascots are exhausting. So I'm really, really trying to, to, to uh, voice more beyond that. But I did create a piece for Standing Rock. And I purposely wanted, if, if we're calling ourselves to Ochete Shakawin, let's show it. Let's, let's show it instead of using these stereotypes and relying on the image of the chief sitting bull. So I created this piece, um, put it on Instagram, put a couple of hashtags on it, and it went viral. And that's the beauty of, of the, the nice thing about incorporating technology and trying to make a movement. But this is also the first time I'm seeing myself as a visual communicator and the importance of myself in a movement like Standing Rock, because now I'm giving images to people who are there to protect and to, and to do something for the good of, of our human being and our rights and the pride and, and the acknowledgement. I'm very, very thankful to be a part of that. And I think a lot of attention, you might see my name associated with decolonizing design or indigenous perspective in, in communication respectful design, but what does that actually look like? There's a lot of people that research and type about it, the hashtag all talk, no show. What does the actual decolonizing design look like? 
So I'm trying to give examples of my work of how, how do you visually communicate us in a non-colonial view, in a decolonized view. So one, this one's a little uh, contradicting because you know Westerners try to force our language into you know American characters, but in terms of we need more indigenous people and typography because we need fonts, we need dictionaries, we need to start writing our language in, 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 our, in our communities but it's hard when we can't even make it to the conversation at the table. And this is, the, this is what I'm trying to advocate. We need, some of us will not have a culture in 30 years. We need students in these seats right now because I'm, I'm advocating that design can save a culture. Also, I wanna show images of, 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 uh, of how, what, what does an indigenous visual language look like when you take away the teepee or the headdress or the buffalo and you actually incorporate our visual languages, but also be aware of what is okay to share to the public and what is not okay to keep sacred. So an Indigenous Peoples Day showing what Lakota visual language looks like when you take away the headdress or when you start introducing our family designs. You remember, you know, we, we were here for thousands of years before Christopher Columbus came. We had ways of communicating. We weren't as Idiot says everyone uh, associated with us, you know, we had ways of visual communicating and it's being lost. So we're trying to revive traditions of, of, of using family designs. And I'm gonna end in, in these two pieces here. I find myself in a challenge now. Uh, here's an example from the World Policy Journal. They did, a art, or they did a showcase on the United Nations Declarations of Indigenous People's Rights, and they came to me to ask if I could design the cover. And here, I'm, they're highlighting indigenous people from all around the world. So how can I design something to represent indigenous people from all around the world without using stereotypes or pan-Indian images? So that, again, this may not be the best way, but I don't see much guidance in anybody taking the challenge of it. So I did my best in terms of trying to find little elements that are relatable to other cultures. Because you have to remember, when, when you're thinking from indigenous ideology, we never knew of the term ownership. We shared. So we shared these symbols with other indigenous peoples over the world. So you might see it that some of our symbols look similar to uh, indigenous people in the Middle East. Um, so uh, doing, so doing my best to pick elements that can, people can find and identify to to be more comfortable. And this last piece here is my most, cont the mo most current piece is actually shown today on the College Horizons Facebook. And for something, another challenge is using ancient symbols with ancient meanings into a more contemporary way. For example, uh, for a college uh, preparation camp for Native American students, we didn't have colleges back in the day, but if you wanted to share the message of education for Native American students. What does that look like? And I'm gonna quickly um, identify in here. So college pride, native pride, and the turquoise are frogs, which represent the students taking leaps on their journey in the corners and the yellow or the green are flowers because your journey through college is the time of birth or uh, growth and blooming to, to the flower you wanna be. And the, around the, uh, the, the lines bordering it and then the corners are seeds and the roots. That's the faculty and the teachers that are planting the seeds to, to grow this knowledge. And up top, uh, I guess, as much as I don't want to say it, in the teepee looking designs, the, those, the symbols represent places of worship. And some of us have the, the saying that education is ceremony or education is sacred. So those places represent institutions and are all connected together because as we end all our prayers, we're all related. So thank you. <laughs> So in the spirit of good balance between practice and theory, I will now let you with Arturo. Well, hard to <laughs> see you with these bright lights, lights on, on my face. But good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. And I want to start by thanking Muriel and Killin and the rest of the organizing committee for being such wonderful host hostess, not only intellectually, but also attention to every detail Deborah and the staff and the volunteers also for making sure everything works so well. It's a great honor to be here with Andrea and Sadie. And I wanted to salute as well the Standing Rock struggle. It's been in the US at least, we're very much aware of the importance of this struggle. 
and, uh, and uh, Sadie has been central to that. And what I'd like to do today is basically go over three points. The first one, or it starts with three premises. The first premise is that design is emerging as a very important or crucial domain for the production of life itself. Design is a world-making practice. Uh, it's about how lives are lived and how worlds are built. And from the very start, from the first session, at the plenary session on Tuesday, and throughout all the sessions that we had here, there are in many ways that idea has been conveyed. The central importance of design today, even more clearly than the social sciences, the human sciences, I think, design is emerging at this amazing domain for critical thinking and critical action about the world. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The second one is that this, this ferment of design is giving rise to what could be called a transnational critical design studies field. And what I'm going to be doing here is try to provide a very provisional initial map of that field uh, with sort of geopolitically and epistemically differentiated between the global north and the global south and suggest that we can start a conversation, a political but constructive conversation between these different tendencies. Okay, so let me start quickly um, just to restate what I say, design is about world making itself. Design, nevertheless, is a central political technology of modernity. So the worlds that design have created are for the most part these modern worlds that are today precisely the source of unsustainability. And so at least a dominant form of modernity that we have to question and we'll get there. And finally, that central to this also is, is thinking about design ontologically. And this is one of the basic statements for me of that idea, which is from Winograd and Flores' original book from 1986, that in designing tools, we are designing ways of being. So this is, uh, for me, one of the best statements about why it's an ontological. Just to give you some intuitive examples, there are many that we could use. I, I'd like to use examples from cities. I, I've been working on cities for the past few years. This is the famous expansion of Barcelona, the Champlain Barcelona, particular way of seeing. I usually contrast it with the with moving around the old sector of the city in Barcelona, the Gothic neighborhood. I will skip that part for now, but especially this contrast, which is a very stereotyped contrast, so don't take me wrong, uh, between the American suburban home, which produces decommunalized individuals, a society of decommunalized individuals, and at the other extreme, we can think about the Maloca, the collective loan house in the Amazon for many indigenous peoples. Still today, there are indigenous peoples who live in the Malocas, in which 40, 50 people can live in a single space. It's not that everything goes, there are rules about, but that allows for profoundly communalized societies, profoundly communalized, de-individualized, in which there are persons always in relation to the environment and to nature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and to ask about, I mean, this is also, again, very simplistic, but I think it conveys the idea of the importance of the question, even without putting the value judgment of whether it was better before than, than now, with digital technologies of what kinds of beings, what, what kinds of humans are we becoming because of the digital technologies we're using and how they connect us to extractivism in Africa, for instance, the bloody wars in Africa, continuously including, even as I click. Okay. So three tensions, three dimensions of the question of who's design. There is a, a, an epistemological dimension, uh, an ontological dimension, and there is a practice dimension. So what I'm going to say is that taken as a whole, again, there are exemptions, there are, there are contestations from within, etc. Taken as a whole, design as a political technology of modernity has worked from a Eurocentric paradigm, expert knowledge base, etc., etc. It has also tended to abide by a dualistic way of being, separation between mind and body, reason and emotion, between humans and non-humans, between us and them, and also an instrumental rationality. And I think most people will agree that this is the case. And what is happening today then is the possibility of a significant reorientation of design and creating then this, what we could call a, an emergent transnational design studies field, differentiated from the global north and the global south, and I'll introduce basically the terms and I'll explain each one of them just very briefly because we don't have too much time. So in the global north, we have, these are the most well-known ones to me, the ones I watch, but also because they focus on the ontological dimension of design. 
design for social innovation, transition design, ontological design, but there are many others. Just in the, the tracks that I visited, uh, the, the, that I attended here, uh, the uh, sessions on new materials, for instance, one focus on textiles, the other, the other one focus on sound, were to me super interesting and, that, and, and new trends in design that are also aiming in this direction. Um, the, uh, the track on, uh, on feminist uh, design as well, also very important, very interesting in pointing at some of these ways, new ways of thinking about design, and then that we have this space on the overlapping of these trends, which is what I think some of the interesting conversations are beginning to happen. So just to say something about each one of them, especially focus on the ones from the Global South, and again, they overlap, they're not completely distinct. Um, design for social innovation, very much associated with uh, Ezio Mancini and his group in Milano, but also a network that he's created worldwide, very interested in terms of emphasizing even the civilizational dimension of design today. And in Mancini's latest book that many of you probably have read, I mean, he really says this is about a new civilization that we're creating, we can create through design. Transition design, we have two great sessions here on transition design, very well attended, uh, out of the original framework proposed by Terry Irwin and Gideon Kosov and colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University. And then ontological design from Tony Fry and Anne Marie Willis and many other people are now working on that context. In the Global South, and then I'll take a little bit more time to explain this, is uh, the decolonization of design is one very important emerging trend and it showed up in many of these questions. And it is mostly based, I think, although it's very much connected to decolonial design, they are somewhat different as well. Decolonial design is more based on Latin American critical theory today. Decolonization of design is more, um, at least the ones that, I, that, I, that I'm more aware of, trends in North America, for instance, by Afro-descendant design theories and practitioners like Tori Tunster in Toronto, at Ocar in Toronto, Sadie herself by indigenous uh, peoples as well. And it's basically the idea is resituating design within the historical context of power and domination in which design has operated. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that probably in the, quest in the following, following discussion. But, but, but thinking that even if design, of course, design, you we can make the argument design did not participate in the original acts of enslavement and the conquest of America. But nevertheless, in the argument that is made, in decolonial theory in particular, is that we are still living within the system that was created then. And that whether we want it or not, we all inhabit this modern backslash colonial world system, which is also heteropatriarchal and is also coded white. And is also, in many ways, a world of of our, in which colonialism has, thr has thrived. Design of, with, from the South, there are many ways to explain this, very much associated with a Colum group of Colombians, but not only Colombians as well. Uh, I forgot to mention, for instance, Ahmed Ansari, PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University, working on decolonization of design, but also engaging with decolonial design and designs from the South. So all of these trends are beginning to converge and people are doing interesting work in that sense. So thinking from the South as an epistemic location. Uh, altered design is not only about other designs, but also design otherwise. So it's not only about producing different kinds of designs, but doing design in a very different way, epistem epistemically, ontologically, politically. Uh, an autonomous design, which is the one that I've been working on, which is basically driven by the question of can autonomy be placed squarely within the scope of design? And by autonomy, I mean the kind of axis uh, of organizing that is so important for many Latin American struggles today, and many struggles worldwide. I mean, I was just in, a month ago in the south of France, look, uh, spending some time with the ZAD, with the Notre Dame de Land, with the resistance against uh, the construction of the airport in, uh, near Nantes. And many of these things, we were discussing how many of these things really apply to struggles within Europe as well, struggles for autonomy, for self-determination, and uh, especially in my case, working with Afro-Colombian uh, communities and movements. And for those of you who follow these academic trends, this will fit within the larger field of political ontology. Okay. 
uh, two other slides, I believe. So what can we say about these conversations that are happening? They are interepistemic and intercultural. So they are not just intra-European conversation of design in the epistemic sense of the term. So they go beyond speaking about design from the perspective of the historical experience and the knowledges produced by Europe understood in the larger sense of the term, I say the Euro-American, European conversation. So it's a conversation that engages many other different locations and epistemes. Uh, it then tells a significant reorientation of design. It's just, uh, you know, maybe I'm exaggerating these trends for, to make the point. Uh, but I don't think they are just completely marginal. I think part of the reflection of the concerns that the audience has expressed is with how we need to pay attention more to these trends as well. And three key issues. There are three key issues that, as I was saying before, in the sort of geopolitics of global north versus global south, that needs to be complicated. I understand that. But then nevertheless, there are these three questions that to me are questions that, that are, create the tensions and the contradictions in the conversations. The first one is the question of modernity, or modernities. I mean, we can pluralize it as much as you want. We're still talking about some sort of modernity in relation to Europe. Is it possible to go beyond modernity? And sometimes I use this paraphrase. You remember the paraphrase, it's easier to imagine the end of the, end of the world and the end of capitalism. Well, now it is easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of modernity. And the end of modernity is a civilizational project, a particular civilizational project that we can trace back to however roots you want to think about, uh, but that nevertheless continues to be, to inform in some sense, the dominant set of social, political, economic practices and design practices in globalization and today with neoliberal globalization. Second, so from that emerges the research program on civilizational transitions, very active. There was a huge transition movement and transition discourses that in design, again, is very much articulated by the group at Carnegie Mellon, but increasingly other people as well. The positionality of the designer, I mean, very important. I mean, we have the concept of inter intersectionality that is a great tool for us to each one of us to position ourselves in multiple ways, intersecting ways. Um, Decolonial the theory in Latin America emphasized for many, especially subaltern peoples, uh, like Afro-descendants, indigenous peoples, uh, speaking from what is called the colonial wound, the colonial wound, sort of that, that long process of uh, the impact of that long process of enslavement and, and colonization and conquest and colonization to which people have been subjected for more than 500 years. And uh, unlearning Eurocentrism, I mean, is something that we all have to do. Uh, and that doesn't mean rejecting everything that is modern, rejecting any ex uh, all expert knowledge, rejecting all technology. I think there's some misconceptions about what unlearning Eurocentrism means. It's unlearning the privilege of speaking and living with the kinds of privileges that, that, uh, that uh, heteronormativity and whiteness and, and, and coloniality uh, uh, give us, so many of us. And finally, very important, because this is a huge debate in Latin America today, the question of the communal. How do we go beyond the liberal individual? I think most design, even design for social innovation, critical design studies for the most part, assume the liberal individual, the autonomous, bounded, discrete individual. If we think from the perspective, and I miss this point that is very important, of radical interdependence of all everything that exists. And to me, that's one of the most fundamental principles. Uh, it's not a truth, it's a principle, it's an ethics. That life entails this radical interdependence of everything that exists. And it's a principle that we, we find not only in indigenous cos cosmovisions, I think Sadie was talking about that. Uh, we also find it in many spiritual traditions, like Buddhism, in the Muntu tradition in, in Africa, uh, we also find it in science, theories of complexity, for instance, are about relationality, the radical relationality, that everything, not human and non-human, that the universe is a universe of, yesterday in one of the sessions of panpsychism or pansentience, uh, that the universe is alive. I mean, that's, that, that ontology of relationality is what we see as, as, as a basis for redesigning design in many ways. 
and then about recommunalizing. And each community in any part of the world in which this community happens to be, here in Limerick, in Helsinki, in Lakota Territory, in Cali, Colombia, where I'm from, every single group is today, I think, has to uh, come up with the question in Europe of what kinds of communities can we recreate, reinvent, because there's an imperative about recommunalizing social life. And that's the last, almost the last slide. So this is a quick summary. It's a little bit very similar to the principles that um, as Sasha Constanza Schock was telling us about yesterday with the uh, uh, design justice uh, movement principles that I see very much emphasized in transition. So a strategy and access for redesigning, redesign, and for, uh, for uh, transitions. Relocalization of activities, relocalization of food is one of the most visible ones. But you can re relocalize, people talk about relocalizing energy, transportation, health, education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, recommunalization, the recommunalization of social life, that I just explained. Building local autonomies, but local autonomies in the collective political, radical political sense of the term. Uh, very important from Latin American decolonial feminism, which I think is the most interesting trend today in Latin American decolonial theory, that there cannot be decolonization without depatriarchalization. So that two things come together and have to come together. Uh, the enhancement of the pluriverse. I haven't explained the concept of the pluriverse, but the, most, the best definition for me is the Zapatista definition. The pluriverse is a world where many worlds fit, that we have to move. We have to say one single no to this single homogeneous, overpowering, globalizing world, and many affirmative yeses to the pluriverse, to these worlds where many, many worlds can fit. And finally, and I leave it to the end, not because it's the least important, for me it's the most important, maybe the liberation of modern earth, which is uh, a statement, I think it, in discursive terms, it's a new statement that is being proposed by the NASA indigenous people in Colombia Southwest that have an amazing and sophisticated elaboration of what they mean by this. And it's a struggle that is going on. This is going on today. They are reconquering lands and territories that have been taken from them. The police comes and kills some of them every time and, and uh, eradicate what they have planted. And they come again the, ne the next night and retake the territory. So, but it's liberation of Mother Earth in the broader sense of the term. And I'll just end by reading the sentence. Uh, this is why we fight, this is why to fight for the earth not only, is not only a duty of indigenous peoples, it's an ancestral mandate for all the peoples, for all women and men and all it, who want to defend life. There it is, yes, come in, the door is open. So this is something that is all for all of us, the liberation of Mother Earth is not just for indigenous peoples, it's all of us have to be, because what they say very clearly uh, we want, we humans won't be free, and non-humans won't be free until the earth is, is liberated. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, while I'll uh, get the... Um, first questions up. Uh, I think we have to start addressing the one of why design is so white <laughs> before we all leave this room. <laughs> but I'll start with that caveat. Uh, why is design so white for whom? I mean, from where I stand, it doesn't look so white either, but... <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let him... I'll let no, him what do you think? Um, but Go on, Sadie. I, uh, how, how, let me, when, when I'm going to share my answer, keep in mind that I'm talking in, in the realm of design education and the equity of resources within design yeah, and education. Um, but to, and I'm using that to give an example to reference of what, how I'm going to answer. So I would say that a lot of design 
in the controversies in terms of race that this is not a racial issue. It's not white versus any other color. It's an issue of structure. It's an issue of a frame. It's an issue of a mold. And those who fit in that structure and fit in that frame are not all white, but the predominant appearance within there. And I'll give an example. Um, in research, what is technically credible research you need or in, in thinking about writing, let's say, a thesis. You know, you'll need a statement, you'll need, uh, you need some theorists, you'll need some methods and frameworks and all these, all these different things that have to be sourced and cited and put into a bibliography. Now, in thinking about resources, and then if that is how we're structuring research in order for me, someone like me, to go get a degree, it doesn't necessarily work for me. Uh, and for the reasons for that, let me give an example. I find the elderly of the Lakota people as scholars. They're the knowledgeable of those of the culture. And I have to admit that a lot of them are still in the struggle. A lot of them have either struggled with unemployment, have never been to an educational institution. You know, my grandmother, she worked at a boarding school for 30 years, has no degrees, but I see her as somebody as knowledgeable in, 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 in my traditions. And when I'm expected to cite something that is Lakota culture, and I can't cite my grandmother because she's not a theorist or a methodist or she's not a doctor or a PhD, what am I supposed to do? So I'm expected to go to the library. Now, if you remember when I said the American history is written inaccurately. So if I know that my history that is written and is sitting in the books in the libraries is not accurate, why would I go grab that source and, and use it? So, and I think about it. So this is my, my thought of, or my, my, pat, or my advocacy of needing more accurate resources in these, in these libraries, especially if we're expected to be in the realm of, of design. Because, so thinking about it, who, if I don't fit in the structure and I'm struggling to, to get a degree, who has, who fits in that mold? Who has the resources? Who has the theories? Who has, who, who, um, I had a conversation and with a Tanvir and she's mentioning when she's talking about uh, getting inspiration for more fashion and she has to go to the li little sliver of the more cultural section <clears throat> in the library versus all the other resources in, that are, you know, predominantly more yeah. white, I guess. And that's a struggle. So the more of the need of many things is the reason why we can't fit in the structure. And there's a predominant presence of those who can. And I'll leave it at that for. What, what do you think about okay. design? <laughs> well, the question I, I've been uh, recalling Elizabeth Chin's work, some of you might know her. She's at the Pasadena College of the Art and, the Art and Design. And in one of her papers, she has this amazing sentence that says, almost literally, there are, there are few spaces as unrelent unrelentingly white as the art and design studio. Does that make sense? And basically, she's pointing out at the whiteness of the, of the design studio and the unexamined uh, uh, sort of whiteness that exists in what she calls design territories. So that's, for, for me, I mean, there's an, there's an answer that is already quite articulated there in, in her work, and I think, I believe she has a new book out that includes some of these elements. Second, for me, it's so important to always acknowledge the very profound anti-black uh, and anti-indigenous racism that exists worldwide, probably worldwide, but certainly many parts of in, in the Western world, and I include Latin America there. I mean, Latin American society, I mean, I'm a very white Latin American male, and, uh, and uh, I'm very conscious in a very uh, heavily black city, which is the city of Cali, where more than 50% of the population is Afro-Colombian, and I see it every day, sort of the profound anti-black racism that exists. So we have to acknowledge that and how design participates in, in that uh, set of social relations and social context. And the last part is to underscore what Sadie was saying, that this is a structural, it's a structural problem that, that again, in, in the decolonial jargon, uh, when we talk about the heteropatriarchal capitalist modern slash colonial world system, the colonial includes the fact that 
this system that inac was inaccurated from with the conquest and is still today in very transformed ways, nevertheless, involved an articulation between uh, race and gender and capitalism and so forth that is still with us today. So again, like I was talking about unlearning Eurocentrism is part of unlearning you know, racism and sexism and so forth. Uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, thinking about this non-whitening relationship to one comment from the audience that says that in Latin America, Africa, Africa Asia, Middle East uh, is decolonizing so white. So if we use this hashtag, do we keep away the focus or we undermine that design that already exists and we're just not talking about here, but, you know, exists? <laughs> And we're just negating it by saying design is white. Mm. Uh, so I think that's a, a thing also to ponder. In the, in the structural sense, uh, I'll agree yep. in the fact that this, what we talked about here and the Eurocentral Anglo-American focus is not the only one that exists. Then I will agree with Sophia. Uh, okay, so let's look a little bit to the ones, uh, to the questions uh, that we have. And uh, the first one talks about how we empower young, young indigenous designers. And there was a comment that has gone uh, very fast off, but was challenging this idea of empowerment as some kind of uh, power position. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, how would you? go about this study? I question this all the time because <laughs> that's, that's what I need to do. I need to be motivating these indigenous youth. And, and what I'm noticing is there's a lack of confidence. There's a common question in America that I get, well, where are all the Native American designers? Well, one, call us designers. And we might acknowledge ourselves as designers first. Because in America, a lot of uh, a lot of acknowledgement indigenous people get is usually in art, it's usually in craft, it's usually in history, it's usually in museums, it's usually in anthropology, but never in design. So I always tell those who ask me the question, well, do you actually acknowledge indigenous people as designers? We're inventors, we're communicators, we're problem solvers, you see it, but it's always pushed into a different, uh, it's never, never in the contemporary sense of research. Um, so to, to uh, I don't, I think at this point in terms of trying to solve something global, I think we still need to build the motivation and life and confidence into the voice of our youth. And a lot of us in my generation, I just turned 28 in, in two days ago, and um, for me this is a lot of stress because I still feel young and not as, as much of an expert as I, as I um, hope to envision. I still have a lot of experience to do, but I do have the responsibility to pave the path for our youth and with the lack of guidance and the lack of indigenous scholars and with the lack of, of resources, it's a little bit hard. So I also either have to mimic other cultures or do my best and, and go from the heart and go from the values and the, and the sense of the cultural people. So. I hope, I hope in my lifetime we can start to have the indigenous people start challenging more global issues, but in this point, from my perspective and from my demographic, it's a matter of getting that acknowledgement, that respect, yeah. and that motivation into them. Yeah, so that's like the long term and then the short term. You need to work with both at the same time. So what, what's your take on Arturo? Okay, maybe a couple of comments and, and, and I'll get to that one. Uh, which was more specific for Sadie, but I want to talk a little bit also yeah. about about uh, uh, about um, and, uh, talking in theoretical ways. Yes. And there was another one. Okay. Anyways, um, and I think that because I think this is important, it's part of the same question. Well, when when we are in the academy, I mean, we cannot not use theoretical language. Is part of the contemporary, let's say, epistemic condition. So we have these tools that are theory, and we have to be always mindful of what they do in the world and what we do with them. So, in a sense, for me, the way in which I try to deal with that question is how to establish conversations always between this theoretical knowledge, especially critical theories produced in the academy about globalization or gender or racism and what have you, in conversation with 
non-theoretical knowledges with knowledges that come from Afro-Colombian peoples, Afro-descendants, indigenous peoples, um, that operate through very different set of rules and very different set of commitments. They are usually more experiential knowledges, embodied knowledges, uh, feeling, thinking kind of knowledges. And politically and epistemically, then how do we create, more contribute to create, to widen the space for those knowledges to, to uh, be considered as credible sources, not only of knowledge and authority, as Sadie was saying, but also credible alternatives to what exist, because we disempower them with our use of theory. So I think that's a very important question. And I think design, because it's not just theoretically, design has this applied component, this, this component of the senses. And yesterday in some, one of the sessions, there was a lot about the senses and the materiality. I think there is an opportunity there to go beyond these theoretical knowledge and Eurocentric knowledges. Mm -hmm. And, um, oops. <laughs> the other point that I wanted to make is, there was a question about, about whether we can teach others in the Global South to design. And I want to make an analogy very quickly with development. Mm -hmm. So one of the main ways in which the Global North has been related to the Global South is through development. We have development, we are developed, they are not. They need development, just to paraphrase very quickly. And maybe I'll make an analogy with three possibilities there in relation to, de to design. The first one is design as development. As in a conventional sense, design as development aid, for instance. In the, and there's a lot of design and development literature going up today, NGOs doing development work. My feeling in relation to that is that some people might improve their life conditions, you might do an interesting project, but taken as a whole, it will always, it, will, it can only deepen the, uh, the, the unsustainability and the inequalities and the injustices that exist already in the world. The second would be design as social justice, or design and development as social justice. For me, one of the best examples of that is Oxfam. Oxfam is one of the NGOs that focuses their work on, on uh, social justice issues, human rights, gender rights, and so forth. That's more interesting, but it still needs to be pushed. And the last one for me, and this is just a provisional hypothesis for now, is can we think about design and even cooperation between North and the South as and for civilizational transitions. And if we do that, then we are already embarked more openly in a journey, a collective journey, in which at the end we won't have the division between Global North and Global South, even if obviously we'll be different, differentially positioned within that, but that we finally come up with a, in a common, in a sense, common but differentiated understanding of yeah. what's going on. So I, I think, or I see at least in, in, in a lot of the kind of arguments that you both, Sari and Arturo, do, as how do we, um, instead of uh, putting up dichotomies, work on building little holes first in the small, but also in the bigger one. So I think that's something we would really need to work more. Um, uh, so we are done with... with uh, with that, with that, I think the um, published theories from Global North and South, you kind of covered yeah. uh, already, and the empowering. So the three ones, I think we can, we, we I hope you will understand that <laughs> we, we kind of uh, somehow uh, cover it. Cover it. Um, I wanted to, to, uh, to, write, to, address this one that just came, says that, why are those who write about design movements given preference over those who do and create those design movements? Um, could the person that wrote this one clarify what she or he means, like design movements? Can you read it again? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, whoops. Now I lost it, sorry. Oh, oh no. Why are those who write about design movements giving preference over those who do and create those design movements? Uh, because I, it caught my eye because of the doing and the, and the writing and these dichotomies. I, I, keep, I keep seeing the, the, the community so preoccupied by this somehow apparent <laughs> incompatibility between thinking, writing, doing, acting. Uh, 
So I want to explore this angst. <laughs> uh, so how could, is, is, well, is, is that? Is, okay, can, uh, maybe, because yes. um, I have a couple ideas coming out, so maybe I can at least give some slight answers and maybe slight, yeah. a couple of answers. Um, one thing, and again, this is just coming from my perspective, is that you notice within design, it's really driven by means of wealth, it's driven by means of power. Mm. It's driven by means of uh, the, I guess, who has access to resources. So when you take away wealth and you take away access to resources or, and you take away the power in the media, you're left with us. You're left with, 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 with us who, who are in the beauty of, of, of design. So let me, let me try to give an understanding. So I'm. The quickest way to, to share my understanding of Western perspective is Western perspective expects a lot of definition. Expects a lot of Westerner researchers need an answer to everything. They need a site, they need a theory, they need data, they need, they need all this. They feel uncomfortable when they don't have an answer or something. They feel uncomfortable when they don't know the translation of a, u a unique language. There's a lot of fear in the unknown in the Western. So if you take the definition part you had to remember this, 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 this quote of ownership was brought to us during the manifest destiny. The, the, the ability to claim something, the ability to own something was never in our means. And I'm gonna give the example of the swastika. The swastika is a symbol that was shared universal, but until ownage, claim came to it, the meaning changed. So you have to remember, coming from an indigenous perspective, there's more share, shareship. There's a lack of hierarchy of who owns what and, and who, who does that. So you have to, and I think that makes people uncomfortable. But when you're wanting definitions, you're lacking the appreciation. You're lacking the, the aesthetics. You're lacking your, your knowledge of beauty and how something works for you and how it understands based on your point, based on what is supposed to be fact. So I would say there is, for those who have